Well, thank you for coming back. It seems like only a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> it does. Uh, I saw your comment about wanting to talk in depth about theater, and, I, and I, I wanted to make sure we tackled that. It's not necessarily that I wanted to talk about it. Uh, in fact, it was kind of nice to talk about other things for a change. Mm -hmm. It's that's what that's what I was expecting. That's usually what people. Uh -huh want to talk to me about. Right, when we right. get into politics, they're like, you're just an actor. What the hell do you know about all that stuff? Let's let's start with that okay. to kind of bridge the two the two conversations a bit. There's a, a seemingly growing sentiment in the world, and we touched on it a little bit last time, that actors don't have the right because we pay them to be entertaining monkeys and they don't have the right to tell us about their political views. Where, where do you stand on that? I... I think we touched on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think anybody's got the right to talk about whatever the hell they want to talk about, whenever they want to talk about it. Uh -huh. um, and I think we touched upon this also. We, you know, we have a president who not only is an idiot, <laughs> but he has no no credentials mm -hmm. for the job. Mm -hmm. Other than that he inherited a lot of money and he's been a, made himself into a sort of pop culture mm. celebrity. Mm -hmm. And by pop culture celebrity, I mean he's a celebrity. I remember when I was younger. Oh, I sound like one of those people when I was younger. <laughs> but there does seem to have been a, a change in the past 15 years or so. People have always wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. I, I think back in the times of the ancient Greeks and Romans, there were people who probably wanted celebrity. Mm. But it seems to me that until recently, people wanted to be famous because... Colon. Something. <laughs> I Insert want to something be here. the best ball player, mm. playwright, chef, now people just want to be famous. Full stop. They don't care what it's for. Mm -hmm. And and we've become fascinated with fame, qua fame, uh -huh. not fame because of a talent or an ability or a skill or perseverance or hard work. Right. Um, so now we have a president who is president only because he created celebrity around himself and mm -hmm. outrageousness. Um, he has no skill or talent at the job. So I think the least among us has more right than him to spout off on anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think almost the, the cab drivers <laughs> of my youth in New York City knew more about history and art and politics right. than he does. And I dare say than Paul Ryan and, and, and many of uh, mm. many of our uh, ruling class do now. Right. It seems like they've vacated that responsibility in this pursuit of being famous as politician, being famous as talking head on. Yeah. And a lot of the actors and 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 other artists that I know are among the most broadly educated people I know right. because to be really good at this craft, you have to be broadly educated. You, you're constantly going to school. I mean, every play I do, I'm going back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not every play. I'm about to do the Sisters Rosenzweig. I don't need to do a lot of research to find out what it was like to be a middle-aged Jew in New York in the 90s. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> but, 
you get you get my point. Yeah, yeah. But but many roles I've played, I've had to go back to school. Mm-hmm. You brought everything full circle. <clears throat> when and where did you first engage in going to school for this craft? Oh, um, give us your roots, your origin story. My origin story. <laughs> well, I, I can remember kind of the moment where I thought where the first germ of maybe wanting to do this for a living uh, happened, I think in, I think I must have been four years old. Mm-hmm. I was backstage, I forget the theater, it was a Broadway theater where my father was doing the play Love by Marie Schiskel okay. with Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson. And uh, I believe I was four. And in in the play, it's a comedy. His character jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh my! Um, and um, the the set was the Brooklyn Bri- was a section of the Brooklyn Bridge, and he jumps over the railing. And there were, of course, mattresses for him to land in. And there was a, a stagehand with a bucket of water to throw up a splash when he <laughs> jumped over. It was it was funny. And I remember being backstage after a matinee and allowed to jump over the railing into the mattresses. Oh, wow. Um, to see what Dad did for a living. And I thought, well, this, this would be cool yeah. to, uh, to get to do that. Um, <coughs> and... Um, and then I just did stuff in high school, you know, in school like, like most kids do. But when I was eight, I did a film with my older brother that my older, that, that my older father, a, a film with my older brother that my father wrote and produced and directed. That, and uh, it was nominated for Best Short in 69, mm. I think, maybe 70, but I think it was 1969. Um, and then uh, had a... a you know, just the regular stuff in school. But then in high school, uh, Horace Greeley High School in Chappaqua, New York, we had a a drama teacher there, a guy named Phil Stewart, who'd gone to Northwestern, and he'd been in school with some of the, the greats of, of his day. Um, and he was incredibly dedicated and very smart and a wonderful teacher and director. And really cared, and uh, he he had a uh, a very academic approach. And I'm of of the members of my family. I would never say I'm the smartest person in my family, but I I think it's fair to say I'm certainly the most academic. Mm. Um, I loved school. I loved college. I went to graduate school for law. Um, I read for the law, as they say in, in England, mm-hmm. um, and 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 nobody else in my family could lay claim to loving the academic life, mm-hmm. and I I did and still do. I'm um, an adjunct professor now, and 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 really enjoy teaching. Uh, but Phil Stewart. Um, so, so he had this he had this academic approach that really appealed to me. Just really taught me how to break down uh, a character mm-hmm. uh, the the way you would with literature. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then after that, in college, didn't study drama in college. Uh, did some acting in college, and then went to law school, and then it was. After practicing law for five years and quitting, my father said, you, you know, you better start studying if you really want to do this. And I, I'd grown up on movie sets and grown up backstage and I'd worked quite a bit, but I didn't have any um, formal training or technique. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, who should I study with? And he said, with Uta Hagen, if you can get into her class. And so... Uh, I auditioned for a class. You had to put a scene together with somebody else, and uh, I asked my older brother to put a scene together with me, and he did. Mm-hmm. Um, we did the old tried and true Biff and Hap in the bedroom, mm-hmm. and I got into her class, and then uh, that's where I started my more formal training as an actor was with her, mm-hmm. and um, 
I love and am still guided by and now teach her technique. And then started studying at her school, HB Studio, also with Austin Pendleton, who's, I think, one of the great teachers and directors of our time. Uh, and they gave me really the the basis of technique that I use. Now, for anyone listening who does not know the name Uta Hagen, it's probably not a theater major, might be listening, but tell us a little bit about who she was and what her technique represents in the broad spectrum of, of acting technique. Uh, I, I, I call her technique, uh, I think of her technique as the auto mechanics of acting. Okay. Uh, so many teachers, I think, uh, who followed Stanislavski, uh, you know, Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, there's this mystique around the method. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't like that. Hmm. She didn't say, I don't like that. But you could tell she she sort of eschewed uh, mystifying the whole thing uh -huh. and, and broke it down into a series of what I think are very simple exercises that help you get to know yourself mm. and and that's the building block for every character that you play to get to know what what is what are what is my behavior what are my motivations um and uh she was a, a great was a great story about her i wish i had been in the theater this night she was um going to be playing uh, Blanche in the first road company of Streetcar. Mm. And, uh, Epic. Yeah. <laughs> and who, who, they had finished rehearsal. And from what I understand, who I forget who played it on Broadway opposite, um, opposite Brando. I don't have that name. Um, but whoever it was was due for a vacation. Uh -huh. So they wanted Uda to go on for her for a week or two weeks or whatever so that she could have her vacation before the company left on the road. Mm. So the story goes that she and Brando met on stage uh -huh. in the performance of that show. No that prior. they had not rehearsed together. Oh, wow. That, that Uta Hagen had rehearsed with her company that was going on the road, and Brando had, of course, been doing it on Broadway for some time. Mm -hmm. And tonight, this woman is going on to play Blanche. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine how electric that must have been to be, yeah. to watch these two great actors confront each other right. with no yeah. rehearsal or preparation. Um, I, I, I wouldn't put myself on a level with either of them, of course, mm. but I had an experience like that and know how electric it is to be in the middle of that experience as a performer where I was doing a long run of a play in New York and, uh, there were two men, two women in the play. And so we had un one understudy for the men and one understudy for the women. Mm -hmm. And one of the women was out. Uh, shooting an episode of a TV show, so the understudy was going to go on for her that night, and the woman playing my wife lost her voice completely, couldn't oh. make a sound. So we were going to have to cancel the show. And then the producers realized that there was another production in Boston. Oh. Just close enough, right? Just close enough. And they flew the understudy from that production down to New York. Mm -hmm. She got to the theater at 7.30. <laughs> And we met backstage. Wow. And we had just enough time. It was a very prop-heavy show. Uh -huh. Food being prepared on stage. Lots, you know, tables being set. We had just enough time to find a costume for her and show her around where everything was. Right. And we were just about to start. The sh curtain's just about to go up. And she, we're still friends. She looked at me and she said, is there anything else I need to do? And I said, yeah. She said, what? I said, I think you need to come over here and kiss me. She said, what? I said, I said, we have to make out in five minutes in front of 500 people. 
And I don't think it should be the very first time. <laughs> and she laughed. She ran over and kissed me, ran back to her place. The curtain went up, and we had this amazing evening. Oh, wow. But to do a, a two-hour performance with somebody playing your wife in this very intimate show, mm -hmm. never having met them, right. Right. was... And she was amazing. She was dynamite. That kind of stuff is always engaging. <clears throat> What if you had to boil it down to like a couple of words? What was it that made it so exciting? Just, I mean, obviously we know the circumstances now, right. but like, what was it, that quality? How would you describe that sort of quality? Uh, we are always striving to make it happen for the first time, even though we've done we've done it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And with her, it was really happening for the first time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no idea if this woman was going to be any good, if she was going to remember her lines. Right. The block, it, her, hers was a different production. It, oh. wasn't, it wasn't a remounting of the same production. Uh -huh. So the, her block, everything had to be negotiated and realized in the moment. Right, right. Um, Incredibly organic. Yeah. Yeah. Because we couldn't rely on anything that worked before because mm -hmm. we didn't have anything that had worked before mm -hmm. together. I think, I think for me, that hits on a point of why we find fascinating, why we find theater fascinating at all. Like the audience comes, they know we've rehearsed, we've done the show however long, it's been up on stage for 10 years, whatever. And yet the hope, the mad, the, the, the hope is that there's going to be this magic first time experience. Um, so it's 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 always engaging and thrilling to hear a story about it actually being being the first time. Yeah, that level of, of excitement. Yeah. Uh, so New York, you've performed there. Uh, do you have a favorite play that you've ever done in New York? That that play that the, with this one, Dinner with Friends, mm -hmm. Donald Margulies play that mm -hmm. that won uh, won the Pulitzer in two thousand, and nice. and that was that was ex certainly exciting. Uh huh. Um, uh, then one of, one of my other my other favorite moments on stage was the night I made my Broadway debut. Uh, I went on in a play uh, only once mm -hmm. in this show. Uh, Neil Simon's Laughter on the Twenty Third Floor. Mm -hmm. and that was in nineteen ninety four. So I was thirty four years old. Okay. So it was 30 years after the moment of jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge into the mattresses. <laughs> and uh, the character I was playing was, you know, so many of his plays are autobiographical. The character I was playing was him mm -hmm. uh, when he was the youngest, newest writer in, in the staff room at the Sid Caesar, mm -hmm. uh, our show of shows. And so the the play starts with him alone on stage writing. He's come in early. Mm -hmm. uh, he's new and trying to get a joke on the air. And he's scribbling away as the curtain goes up. And after a few moments, he looks up and sees the audience, puts down his pencil, stands, and says to the audience, I guess this is what I've dreamed of my whole life. So to get to to get to uh, say those words, it's my very first words on yeah. Broadway, was uh, no acting required. Right, <laughs> just talk. Right, right. <laughs> A true moment of like passion and honesty. This just yeah. and to celebrate just the like, actual act yeah. of it. Here I am, mm. thirty years later, mm -hmm. and I've been dreaming of this, and now it's happening. Right. The rest of the night after that was like being strapped to the front of a Japanese bullet train. <laughs> um, uh, because when you go on as an understudy, again, it's that circumstance where you, you're working, you've never been on stage with these people before. Mm -hmm. You've rehearsed with some other understudies and the right. stage manager, and suddenly there's an audience and the, uh, and the real team and... Uh, particularly in a Neil Simon play, mm -hmm. it went, nothing could have prepared me for how much louder, faster, funnier it had to be. Right. It, everything changes when there's 500 or 1,000 people staring at you, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. There's, um, there's something strange about that. In your experience being in front of audiences of different kinds and sizes, um, 
What do you think that is? That strangeness of being in front of others and having that many eyeballs on you. Is that, is that just in our heads or is there something tangible there? Um, I think there's a couple of things. I think there's one aspect to it that is just in our heads. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's that thing they talk about now, 10,000 hours. You, mm-hmm. don't, you don't have mastery of something until you've been doing it for 10,000 hours. And certainly I don't think I have a, a mastery of what I do. But I, I, do, feel the, I do feel the security of those 10,000 hours. I mean, I haven't sat down and calculated how many hours I've spent on stage. Right. But, um, but I have to be getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, and the 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 level of relaxation that comes, uh, and I know there are actors for whom this isn't true, but but at this point in my career, I I'm not scared or mm-hmm. uh, you know people say, are you conscious of the audience? Well, I'm conscious of the audience in the sense that I'm not psychotic you know <laughs> I don't forget where I am right um, and you have to particularly in comedy you have to maintain a consciousness of the audience mm-hmm. um, uh, the director Jerry Zachs used to come backstage after a preview performance and he would say people 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 if they're laughing don't talk. And if they're not <laughs> laughing, talk. <laughs> so so you, you, you have to be conscious of them the way a surfer has to be conscious of, of yeah. the wave. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's ancillary to, to staying connected to and conscious of what's going on on stage. So... There's that level of, oh, I'm in front of an audience. Um, the, the consciousness of them or a degree of self-consciousness if you're not comfortable in front of an audience. But there's another aspect to what I think you're talking about and asking about, which is some sort of um, psychic connection or shared consciousness of Mm -hmm. the moment of the event that's transpiring that I think if everybody's serving the story Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, you know, that's, that's what we do Mm -hmm. story. Um, That if everybody's in service of that, if the audience is there wanting to receive if the if the if the if the members of the company are there wanting to give as opposed to wanting to get right um uh then i i do think that there's a sort of a swirling communal experience mm-hmm. that that gives everybody a kind of energy yeah there was a great thing that I heard on an an interview on NPR with a a fellow who was a concert pianist. Um, And I try to remember this when I'm working. And I I tell my students to remember it when they're working. Uh, Audiences, I think, don't don't want to see somebody nervous or scared. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's our job to take care of them, the audience, not their job to take care of me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this this pianist said that he he had been preparing, I guess, for his debut at Carnegie Hall. He'd been up and coming, and then World War II broke out, Mm -hmm. and he was away for years, and then came back and had to practice again. And then he's making his debut at Carnegie Hall, and he's walking towards the stage. And I guess there was this guy who... uh, Opened the door for everybody to get out on stage. And he said, the fellow opened the door for me. I stepped across the threshold. I said to myself, now remember, don't ask them, tell them. Mm. And, you know, we all bring our insecurities to to certain 
aspects of our work. But I think the biggest, one of the biggest gifts we can give the audience is for that time to put, if I can put my insecurities aside and mm-hmm. my need for affirmation or whatever it is that certain artists want from an audience, right. if I can put that aside for the time and tell them, this is how this play goes. Mm-hmm. This is who this character is. There's time enough later to, you know, at the opening night party or at the bar to right. to, to enjoy the, you were great, uh-huh. you know. Uh-huh. Um, but but if you're asking to be told that you're great during the show, you're doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I I think that it's something audiences can discern in a performance and and some people don't care they might see the difference but they might not care but i think right. a, a lot of audiences are savvy enough to be like oh and it takes them out yeah of the experience now from what you said it sounds like um you you might agree with the statement that theater is more than just an entertainment right it's it's a little bit something oh, yeah. loftier than just a lot more than that i think the most important thing we can do theater film t- television any of it um, and this is another, you know, I talk about this the very first day of classes in the summer program that I teach here, you know, because I don't like to lecture about it, mm-hmm. but to me, I think one of the biggest things wrong with the world, go back to our president, yeah, is that. And one of the biggest problems we face as as humans, as a species, is that we're really capable of saying, of uh, pointing at another member of our species and say, "You, you are other." Uh huh. I, I don't think other animals, species, are able to do that. Right. Um, not to the degree that not we to can. the degree that we can. I mean, I suppose wolf packs have, you know, my pack, your pack. Uh huh. But, but we, we but literally we look, have a word say, for dehumanizing Yeah, people. we dehumanize. You are not yeah. human. Uh-huh. Um, and story, theater, film, television, I think are, is really good at, at uh, getting people to recognize the human in something that mm-hmm. seems other. I did a play here... Um, several years ago called The Whale, in which I played a, a 600-pound man dying of congestive heart failure. 600 pounds, gay, filthy. Mm-hmm. The apartment is filthy. And one of the first images of the play, and I thought it was Samuel D. Hunter, the playwright, so courageous. One of the first images of this play is this mammoth, Filthy, sweaty, you know, my they put all kinds of gunk in my hair to just make it look like I hadn't <laughs> showered for a long time. The sweat clothes, you know, just every... It was repulsive to look at. And one of the first images is this 600-pound filthy man masturbating to gay porn... That you can hear loudly <laughs> slapping and just grunting and <laughs> and to an Orange County audience. Uh-huh. That's the opening image of this play. And it was as if he picked up the audience and threw them against the back wall of the theater. Made them want to go as far away from this repulsive human being as they could possibly get. Mm-hmm. And then he spends the next hour and 45 minutes very quietly saying, not literally, but it felt as if the, the play was doing was saying, come, look, look inside. And by the end of the, by the, end of the evening, you just, you just heard, if you were in the theater, you just heard audibly every night people sobbing, mm-hmm. sobbing at this man who they now love. Uh-huh. Dying as he tried to heal his relationship with his daughter. Mm-hmm. And people were devastated by yeah. it. Um, and uh, came to see it. If people would come to see it again, 
And also, you know, there were, um, I was told by house staff, I never saw the audiences because it took me 45 minutes to get out of everything I was in to oh. play that role. Yeah. But that the house staff noticed that the that there was a remarkable upsurgence in the number of morbidly obese people coming to the theater to see this show. Uh -huh. And I think it was because somebody was saying, I think the most powerful thing we can say to anybody, which is, I see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There was no, I remember loading that show in uh, and helping hang focus the lights. And I can't remember if I saw it or not, which makes me feel terrible because I was not coming to see a lot of shows back then. I think I was busy working my own projects after, you know, I'd come here to work right. and then I'd go do little storefront theater. But I, I, I remember that there was a question in my mind and I'm asking you as the, as the person in the fat suit, there was a question in my mind, is this show helping to like build bridges between those who do not see themselves in the fat suit and those who might see themselves in the fat suit, regardless of their actual body image? Mm -hmm. or, is, or is this show sort of you know, capitalizing on stereotypes to be funny? And from what the, No, it's just, not a comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, what you're was, sharing here, it seems like it was really a powerful uh, catharsis going on there. There was one night where the last scene started, and by the last scene, I'm on oxygen and mm -hmm. talking like... <gasps> Piss between every couple of words to get, you know, it was just, yeah. um, and the last scene started, and it's clear, you know, everybody knows this guy's not going to make it. Mm -hmm. He's going to be dead by the end of the show, mm -hmm. pretty clear. Um, and the, the question of the show really revolves around, like, is he going to be able to achieve what he wants to achieve before he dies, mm -hmm. which is to sort of save his daughter from... Uh, hating the the entire world forever, which mm -hmm. is sort of what she's decided to do. And the last scene started, and there's a woman in the front row. Who at the beginning of the scene, I heard, and I'm not kidding you, it was this loud. I heard, "Oh God, oh God," and it went on through the entire scene every 10 or 15 seconds and getting louder throughout the whole scene. <laughs> like an eight-minute scene. Just going, oh, God. Uh -huh. Oh, God. So by the, by the end of the show, she's going, oh, my God. And, and the lights go out and the curtain call, and I, I'm standing. I couldn't move anywhere. At the, the lights go out. I'm standing center stage with the end of the play. Uh -huh. And uh, I would be dizzy. So the minute the lights went out, the woman who was playing my daughter would, like, grab me uh -huh. in case I was disoriented when the lights went out. And then I would just stand in place as the rest of the cast came out for the curtain call because in that suit I couldn't yeah. bustle around. <laughs> and the lights came up, and she was standing in front of me, reaching towards me, just tears streaming down her face. Uh. And I'm standing there in the curtain call saying to her, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Saying, I'm okay. I'm okay. Because she just, I, that, that play did it to some people. They mm -hmm. could lost the, that yeah. curtain between the, the, and there was one evening too when um, a man came backstage after the show and said, uh, I'm wondering if we can get somebody from the cast to come out to the lobby because there's somebody having a really hard time. And and I was again, I was stuck in this stuff so I couldn't go, but we were like what what's wrong? He said um he said, "Well, I'm a I'm a therapist and this kid just he he needs to know that that everybody's okay and this wasn't real." Right. Even though he knew he was in a theater, but yeah. he had somebody, I guess, in his life who he had lost to to, to obesity like mm. that, and it just it it cracked him somehow, mm. cracked him open, and um, so Wyatt Fenner, who was also in the show, wonderful actor, sweet guy, went out and spent a few minutes with this mm. kid talking to him and saying, "Hey, you know." 
We're all okay. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, and I've had uh, I've had similar experience, not not with my work, but um, my father did a, a film years, years, years ago, which which if if he did it now would there he'd get in trouble. Mm. Or the movie makers would get in trouble. It was a movie called Poppy, mm-hmm. in which he played a uh, Puerto Rican father of two young kids mm-hmm. in Spanish Harlem, trying to raise these kids mm-hmm. in New York in the '60s, which was not an easy place for right. Puerto Rican families at that time. <coughs> and. Uh, it's a beautiful movie, and I think a, one of his better performances. Um, and I've had um, people of Puerto Rican descent come to me and ask me to thank him mm. for the dignity that he brought to to That's powerful. those people. Yeah. Um, and again, it's that thing of somebody saying, "You, you are seen." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, you said he'd get the, the movie makers would have gotten in trouble today. I think because not the because, he, because he's you know a Jewish guy playing a Puerto Rican, and right. <clears throat> why uh, you know uh-huh. why isn't Hector Elizondo playing this role? Right. And actually, I think I think they made a TV series of it. Uh-huh. Um, and I. I don't remember if it was Hector or was there an actor, Rennie Sim? I'd have to Google it. Sure. If only somebody would make a device <laughs> where you could look things like that up. <laughs> instantly. Um, instantly. And I'll go into another place. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, they did, ma- I think, make a TV series of it that didn't last long mm. that I think did have somebody... Um, of Latin descent, origin, whatever the right language is to sure. use for that. I think that I think that, that story <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. No, 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 it's all right. Um, I think that the a salient point that you uh, shared with uh, with that story is that even an actor of the incorrect origin can bring dignity to a role and be an inspiration to an audience and bring catharsis to people of that origin. Um, and that's something that I think in our current climate we might be easily you know, ignoring or, or not attending to. And there must be a balancing point because I, I agree with the idea that, well, if it's supposed to be a black guy, why is there a white guy doing it? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And if it's supposed to be, you know, of a certain, there's certainly lines that, like, why are we doing it that way? But there's also, I think it, I think it can flow the other direction, where you know, uh, it is acting after all. We're pretending to be someone. Yeah, and we've. It, it's always going to have to be a fluid decision based on a number of different factors. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, at a certain point, it's like, well, he's Irish, but he's not from. Cork, right? You know, it's like wait a second. At a, you know, I mean, <laughs> British people play, change their accents to play. You know, and how, uh, where are we gonna, where are we gonna draw the lines, and where are we not gonna draw the lines? And I'm not saying we shouldn't be having these discussions mm-hmm. and figuring it out. Yeah, but I, I get into a thing sometimes. Like, you know, I grew up in my family doing accents. We did accents all. All the time, of every kind, German, French, British, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Chinese. And, you know, I can tell the difference between a Japanese and a Chinese and a Vietnamese accent. Uh-huh. And, you know, Thai, you know, all different regions of, of England. And, and what's funny is, lately, over the past several years, I may do an accent and somebody will be like, that's racist. Mm. Like, mm, is it? 
Why is it racist if I do this accent, but not if I do that one? Right. Why? Wh- when is it practicing my craft? When is it having fun? You know, the the line between racist and racial yeah. can get blurred. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's gotten blurrier. It, yeah, and I and I, I mean wouldn't... I talk like this all the time. And I make, you know, and I know those people from New York who talk like this. And I'm not making fun of them. <laughs> but you are being Some funny. Of, yes, <laughs> there's a difference between being funny and between finding the humor in mm. and making fun of. Mm. I think there's a difference. I agree with you. And I think that the difference <clears throat> that's being lost, perhaps is that one, m- making fun of is being pejorative and ultimately seems to be anchored in some hatred for that that object, that target, that person, that group. Whereas finding the humor is about laughter and that's not and, hate. And loving that group. Yes, yes. I mean, I love those people. Yeah, I yeah, went yeah. to Temple with those people and I <laughs> love them or the cab drivers or whatever. And I, I love them right. and I got so much from them. Mm-hmm. But the way they were and the way they talked is part of my the rich experience of them. Yeah, and um, we've got to be able to enjoy that. Yeah, and we have to be able to allow. I think, and like you were saying, we have to have these conversations as a society. But I think we have to be willing to allow when we can't find that quote authentic actor that literally is that. That 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 kind of person, we have to allow for the imitation of it in some reasonable fashion, or else we can't do the show. Or we can't play, have that right. character. There was a question with the whale at one point. So, uh, it went away very quickly, mm-hmm. but there was a very little bit of noise from a couple of people at one point of why didn't you cast an actor of size? Right. It's like, well. Because somebody who weighs 600 pounds could not do this show eight times a week. Yeah. There's, at the, at the, Period. The health concerns <laughs> yeah. that that real person is facing is prohibiting the, rep- the artistic representation of the very act of it. Right. It makes so much sense. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> I have a, an interesting sort of inverse where sometimes you like – I have a story from when I was doing a, a – a small one act to sort of prove that I could direct for a storefront company. And they, they had selected the seven scripts. It was a little collection uh, about, you know, all, each of them based on a sin, seven deadly sins. And I get assigned a cast that is about uh, blood diamonds and uh, the leader of a nation in Africa that was like, oh, whatever, we'll profiteer on that. So it required a very black actor to, to accurately even begin the idea of representing it. And, and I said, okay, we're in Santa Ana. And there's not, I'm, I told the director, I'm like, I don't know that I'm going to be able to cast this. Not because I don't know black actors, but I just don't know that we're going to be able to bring the, find the right one in all the circumstances. And I tried for three weeks. And the three or four people that signed up for auditions never showed up. They just blanked. They just bailed out. So I said, listen, I, I can't do this script. Uh, let's, can I reassign, do something different? And the first thought that this person had was to ask me to do it in blackface. And I, and I had to stop it and, like, decide and, you know, deal with the politics of, like, is that wise or is that a, a step too far? Right. Uh, and it was, I was a bit shocked that someone would recommend that, which is, you know, very different than saying you can't do that because you're not authentically that person. Right. As opposed to going, hey, you know, just fake it as fake as you can. Uh, wow. And I think it's interesting that artistically, uh, in our in our uh, industry, there's that much of an extreme when it comes to how we represent each other in stories. Yeah. Uh, but I want to bring it back to to your through line. You talk about we talked about it earlier in our first conversation, and today, of course, it's very important. You know, uh, story and storytelling. Um. And and I have so many questions. When it comes to, uh, let's say, you, you, you like to direct shows, right? You, you're, are you directing or are you not I'm directing? directing a little bit, yeah. Mm-hmm. Certainly teaching a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in terms of selecting material, let's say you're selecting material for your students or whatnot, 
what elements of storytelling inspire you to go, this is a piece that should be worked on? And like, what do you look for in terms of, of that? Um, characters struggling for connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whether, whether it works out or not. Mm-hmm. Um, struggling for connection, struggling for redemption. Um, I, I sort of know, I, I feel like I know everything I need to know about how things don't work out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I want to see people struggling to make things work out, even if they fail because uh-huh. of their their weaknesses or their hidden places or their shame or mm. uh, whatever it is. But, um, and then I say that and then I think, yeah, but, but I love Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. So, <laughs> um, and does that, does that fit my, my paradigm? Um, uh, I guess maybe it does in that the, the, each of those guys is struggling to su- survive yeah. um, the best they know how in a really shitty world. Right. Um, uh, but um, but I, I do love to see people tr- trying to make it work. Mm-hmm. Even if they can't, and and I and I and 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 I feel like that's what people would certainly what students miss a lot of times. It's like even George and Martha are trying to make it work, mm-hmm. and if they're not, then there's no reason to watch that play. Yeah, yeah. So in. Working with students. Um, I just say, don't do it that way. Yeah. You just don't get... do that anymore. Right. I don't want to see. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't want to see that. It's, it's difficult, right? Because um, in the work that students do, uh, there's a lot of uh, obvious choices that have probably been done a thousand times. Right. Uh, what, what kind of guidance, how do you help them to discover for themselves the best way to capture this struggle? Oh, um, to look into how, they, how it relates to their struggle mm-hmm. and what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to say that what I'm trying to teach my students is how to actually experience the scene rather than play the scene. Yeah. Because we're really bad at imitating human behavior. (laughs) Human behavior is too complex and nuanced Uh to be imitated. Uh When somebody's trying to pretend to be a human being, they generally do a pretty crappy job. Mm. And if you can get to the point where you actually experience the scene... Right. <clears throat> so, long story short, for me, it's all about doing everything you can to find an identification with that character and do all your homework and then th- throw it all out and say the first line and see what happens mm-hmm. in the scene. Because mm-hmm. if, if you've done your homework, found an identification with the character, and then say all of the lines in order, the scene will get to the end and what's supposed to happen will happen. Right. And it will be much more interesting and real if you allow it to happen rather than make it happen. Yeah. It's like, I often assign the first scene in, in if I have older actors in the class, I'll, I may assign the first scene of to the salesman. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's Willie coming home. And I'm, I'm notorious in my classes for stopping a scene one line in or two lines in. They'll start the scene and I go, okay, I got, I'm sorry, I got to stop you. And they're like, we, t- I, j- I just walked in the door. I'm like, yeah, but if you do that wrong, 
you're not going to be able to get on track for the rest of the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, the old saying, well begun is half done. Yeah. If you, you shoot that arrow, and if you, if you have the right tension on the bow and it's pointing in the right direction, it's going to land where it's supposed to land. Mm -hmm. If you got the wrong tension on the bow, it's pointing in the wrong direction, it's not going to go anywhere near the target. Right. So when I see that guy playing Willie Loman open that door at the beginning of the play, like a guy who's going to kill himself in 24 hours. <laughs> Curtain. Yeah. Um, the play's about a guy trying not to kill himself. Mm -hmm. It's not about a guy... Killing himself. Killing himself. Yeah. It's all about um, the, <coughs> the tension and the struggle to... Can this not happen? Mm -hmm. You know? I mean... And another example I'll use with my students is, you know, I've seen Casablanca God knows how many times. Mm. Every time I see it, it's possible she's not going to get on that plane. When, when you learn as an actor how to live in that space of, even though I've read the script, yeah. maybe this time mm -hmm. it will work out if it's tragedy. Yeah. You have to be thinking, maybe this time... Maybe this time Romeo will wake up. Right. Or else um, it's a given, and then who cares? Yeah. And, mm. um, and uh, the reverse is, in a, tr in a comedy, it's like, oh, maybe it's not going to work out, you know? <laughs> it's not, you know? Um, and that's what keeps it alive. And as an actor, you have to live in, you have to find a way to live in that space. Mm-hmm. Every night. Right, right. Of all the shows, have you ever performed in a show where, and I've heard this from others, and I think I can claim to have experienced this myself on occasion, where it's almost like you're having an out-of-body experience, and you or your consciousness are, are almost sort of like surprised by uh, the unfolding of events, even though you've known it and you've rehearsed it? You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of times I've fallen. So this may be different, but I've I've fallen asleep on stage a couple of times, <laughs> and then I was surprised by the unfolding of events when somebody woke me up and it was like, "You're supposed." To... Um, <laughs> Is that really happened? Um, <laughs> the first time it happened was I was doing a play in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and. Uh, at one point in the play, my character hid in a crib for like seven minutes. Okay. That's just long enough, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was hot and the lights are down and, <laughs> and I fell asleep. Okay. And the woman playing my wife is shaking the crib. And then I was doing a play down at La Jolla Playhouse with Linda playing Linda Geringer's husband. Uh -huh. And I love her. She's great to work with. And at the end of the first act, my character takes pills, tries to kill himself. Okay. So I have two scenes in the second act in a hospital bed, in a gown, <laughs> under the blankets, with my wrists secured to the, you know, security bars on the, on the hospital bed. So the first scene in the second act, I'm lying in the hospital bed talking to my daughter. Mm. And then they had, they had stagehands dressed as orderlies. And instead of wheeling the bed off stage, what they would do is they just wheel it upstage and pull a curtain in front of it right. at the end of the first scene. And I would lie in the bed for, I think it was close to 15 minutes, oh, shit. under the lights, <laughs> in a gown. And then the next scene was when Linda, my wife, comes to visit me in the hospital and they they would pull the curtain and wheel the bed down, and Linda and I would have our conversation. Uh -huh. And it was in the crew's running notes. <laughs> said, make sure that Mr. Arkin is awake. Because I'm lying there for 15 minutes. I would <laughs> fall asleep. And Linda would look at me, and she could tell if I'd been <laughs> out. She would look at me like, you son of a bitch. You, you were asleep again. And I'm like... I'm supposed to be on pills. I right. have my stomach pumped. I'm on tranquilizers. It's whatever. 
<laughs> I suppose I really shouldn't admit that, but it's the truth. The truth is the truth is the truth. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's not I don't know that it's setting me free, but <laughs> but it is the truth. Um but uh Yeah, th- there there have been a lot of times in in uh in in good place with the, with a really good company where it's where you get the feeling you're in a living experience rather than mm-hmm. rather than putting on a performance yeah i think that i think that when actors share that whether they realize that it's happening or not it it heightens whatever magic the audience experiences you know and i think that one of the fascinating things to sort of uh refer to history is that throughout theater history there have been individuals who are like ah I have this recipe, I have this method, I have this technique. Uh, and and I'm, I've always been intrigued by that because they have this, there's such a specificity. Uh, and one of the things that students and even teachers have sort of been like, well, you know, in trying to explain all that, it's like, but why? Why does this guy want us to do things and breathe funny and hang upside down and, and this person? And I think that there's there's a sort of, it's an interesting fact that theater is one of the oldest historical institutions. When we were living as, you know, migratory hunter-gatherers, we gathered around a fire and told each other stories. Yeah. And I think somewhere deep down at an organic level, at a level of this happens to our biology, there's stuff that gets activated. That and you, I think you used the word psychic. I think that there's definitely something above and beyond the mundane. Mm-hmm. that occurs. And each of our techniques or styles, or this has been a recipe to try to in, uh, inhabit that or invoke it uh, and try to try to bring it out of us. On top of all the necessary work of, you know, knowing the words and knowing the blocking and, and, and identifying with with the personalities we're trying to portray. Uh, yeah, and I think there, are, there isn't a recipe. I think there are recipes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think one of the problems we run into with theater education is that you have a great teacher, somebody who's able to communicate a way of working to a company of people that are around him or her. Mm-hmm. And there's a magic to that. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then people try to codify it. Right. And, and you can't codify it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's enough of it. I mean, that's what every every church and religion has tried to codify. Yeah, what some master had, uh-huh. and what that master had was an energy. Uh-huh. If 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 the words did it mm-hmm. by themselves, you know, the golden rule, pretty simple. Yeah. People don't do it, you know. The, the the you can't codify that, right behavior, generosity, yeah. um, legislating that sort of thing doesn't doesn't help actually induce that no. energy. I, I tell my students what I want them to do is build a toolbox mm-hmm. from. Anything that I tell them that helps and anything that any actor or director Mm -hmm. or stagehand or lighting does anybody they ever work with Mm. gives them something that helps that goes in the toolbox. I don't like orthodoxy in anything in religion, in acting, in cooking, you know, it's what's going to work right now in this part. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, there are parts that I approach with an incredible amount of research and preparation, and there's other parts that I approach with, well, let's see where this goes, right. you know, right. depending. And, and often what that has to do with, you know, I talked about identification before. The amount of work that I think needs to go into a role is proportionate to the distance between me and that character. That is beautifully said, sir. And I don't think anybody I've... Uh... Uh, studied under has ever put it quite like that and I can't I have to completely agree with that yeah that the 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 larger the disconnect the more investment in bridging that disconnect yeah understanding it finding 
where where is the link between me and this person? Mm. <coughs> you know, um, when I was doing dinner with friends, I was pretty much that guy <laughs> in my life yeah. at that time. Uh-huh. Um, and the 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 hardest work in doing that role was in because there was. There was so much pressure that I felt um, being sort of the least experienced member of the cast. The buzz that was around the play because Donald had come close to winning the Pulitzer Prize with Sight Unseen. And mm. there was a lot of expectation. And so I was working really hard on that role. <coughs> <coughs> And Dan Sullivan, our director, no matter what I did, I'd come into rehearsal and he'd take it away from me. Mm. Huh. He's given tons of notes and all kinds of direction to the other people in the cast and really working with them. And when it came to me, he was just like shaking his head and saying, no, I don't think that's it. No, no, not with disapproval. Like he w- It wasn't like he was telling me I was, mm-hmm. you know, behind the eight ball or something. That's just how he was working with me. Mm-hmm. Until finally one night, we were in previews out of town. And uh, I got to the theater and I was just, I was freaking out. I was like, I, I haven't cracked this role yet. I don't know what to do. I, I've, I've tried every tack i've you know mm-hmm. used every tool at my disposal and i'm still getting the sort of quizzical head shake from from dan sullivan so i got to the theater this one night and i said okay we're out of town so who cares mm-hmm. you know there's an audience but there's no critics and right. What I'm doing isn't working, so I'm going to go out there and I'm not going to do anything. Mm. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to say my first line and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I went out and it was terrifying. And I was shaking through most of the show Uh and felt like I'm just standing here (laughs) seeing what happens. Uh And the show is over, and Dan Sullivan comes walking backstage, and he looks at me, and he goes, um, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, I think that's it. Mm. And I was like, oh, stop working, Mm -hmm. and start seeing what happens, start having the experience, because... What I wasn't paying attention to was that I knew this guy well enough. I kind of was that guy. So anything I was trying to do was going to be fake. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. We're always talking about in theater, be present, be in the moment, be here now. And sometimes to achieve that is literally to not do, but to be receptive, right? To be really receptive. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Um, do you think theater can save the world? I know that's a little bit of a right out of left field there, but do you think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it can help. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think the... I think if we bring the the spirit of receptivity and wanting to know the story of the other to the theater and then can expand that to other areas in our lives mm-hmm. that it can help save the world yeah if we I just saw this terrific show called collateral mm-hmm. on Netflix it's only four episodes British series and it's a crime drama but it's sort of it is sort of about having perspective and seeing other people Mm. 
other people's stories and understanding them. Um, yeah, we, we just, we need to start seeing each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I totally concur. Along those lines, I've always wondered, why is Broadway Broadway this mecca of theater? To the point of being elitist, because, you know, the Joe Schmo on the streets got to beg for tickets, you know, through the lottery system or whatever, and try to get in. Um, and it, it just seems to keep getting, the, that glass ceiling seems to be going higher and higher, and tickets go up. And and then the rest of the, the rest of the, the our, of our nation has hubs of, of interesting theater buildup, but none of it is that intense. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I and I and especially now in our tech, post technology era, I see I see that weird concentration. A certain handful of cities have got the best theater, right? And then, but simultaneously with our film and and television entertainment, now you can just you can just get it anywhere. You know, yeah. you just it's everywhere. There's too much media to consume in that on that end of the spectrum. Um, do you think there's some lessons that are Film media can learn from theater, and some lessons that our theater industry can learn from film media. Or is that too um, weird of a question? <laughs> I think right now, I think there's something that the theater can learn from film in the sense that you know, even Broadway's not Broadway anymore. I don't think you know Broadway's become so. First of all, it, it's almost all musicals now, and mm. these huge mega musicals, straight plays, don't. Yeah. have much of a chance on Broadway anymore unless they've got a somebody who's already a star right. in them. Um, it's one of the reasons I left New York was I started feeling like I'm not going to get another Broadway show until I have a TV series. Uh, you know, it's right. um, I was I was uh, you know not to sound bitter, but I felt like I was losing roles to. And, and I get I get it that it's a business. If you can't put asses in the seats and sell tickets, you can't keep the theater open. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, and I've said to students of mine, I've said, uh, who object that their partner, their scene partner isn't good. And I say, you, you think you're going to get a job on Broadway and you're going to be working with great actors. I said, the way Broadway is now... You'll get a lead on Broadway. You'll be opposite Kim Kardashian, for Christ's sake. You know, I mean, <laughs> seriously. If she said she wanted to do a Broadway show, she'd be you know, bingo. In a heartbeat, right? Yeah, because she'd sell tickets. Mm. Um, that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons I love working here mm-hmm. at South Coast. They, they hired good people yeah. and they hire not only good actors but they hire good people mm-hmm. like I've worked with people here whose performances have been terrific and I know they'll never be invited back here again because it's it's they want it to be a company experience mm-hmm. with, you know and that's why people who work here there you, you see people who work here over and over and over again it's because they come to serve the play, they come to serve the theater, they come to serve the company, mm-hmm. and it's it's not about that and them. And you can feel that energy when it comes into the room of this is about me. Yeah, you know? and uh, those people tend not to show up here. Right. I respect that about any any industry or organization that that really adheres to that. Uh, some people have asked me as as a person who studied all of theater, why mm. have I uh, committed to being just a, 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 as I said to you before, I think off the record I said I, some people just see me as a, a monkey with a wrench up a ladder. Mm-hmm. It's like why have, I've been coming, I've been working here for eleven years. That was a wrench. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the monkey and the ladder I got. I right. don't know anything about tools. Fair no, enough. Okay. Fair. <laughs> but but uh, and it's like you could be working anywhere else, or you could be doing something different, and you keep coming here and I'm like, well, part of it is that I love this environment and I love 
how it's about that. What you said, servicing the show, servicing the process, you know, being of service to making something happen for the audience. Uh, and that had, I've worked under five different master electricians. Um, and if I was loyal to only one of them, I would have left. Right. You know, my loyalty is in the phenomena. Yeah. Then that transcends any of the individuals occupying any of the roles, no matter how much I may or may not like them or whatever. So I, I, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing to see that in others and not feel quite as, as silly because not everyone quite gets that, I think. Um, but it's great to know that if, at least when it comes to casting and stuff with actors that we, we are cognizant of that and we look for that in people and make sure that they're, they're good people to work with as well as, uh, you know, not, not uh, impress- just impressive yeah. on the stage. This next show... Um... It's not completely cast yet, but from what I know, what it looks like, I will be working with one, two, four people who I've worked with before here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in a play, like either in a play or in a reading or work, you know. Right. But to, to go into rehearsal with people who you already have a, a relationship and a shorthand with, uh-huh. I, I've never had that before anywhere else. Mm-hmm. There's something, there's something. And a director that I've worked with right. twice before, you know, it's yeah. like, oh, we know how to do this together. We, uh-huh. we know each other's rhythms and. That's, that, that's got to be a lovely experience, as opposed to that the challenge of overcoming that. Right. With a completely and showing the, up and feeling like, oh, I have to prove this to these people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had one or two other questions in mind earlier. Let me see if I can pull them back up. So theater can help save the world. Uh, if there was one thing you would change about the industry at large so that it could help save the world even more, mm-hmm. what might that be? Oh, I would work so much more than I do. Oh, that wouldn't save. That would only save my world. Uh, well, who was it that said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world? You yeah, got to start at home. Right, got to start at home. Save my world, and then I'll start saving more of the larger world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it would be. Um, Oh wow, that's a good tough question. If I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. The the biggest change in the the thing that needs most to be changed about theater. Sure, as an industry, yeah, as an industry. Um, boy, some way to out reach better mm-hmm. to people. Yeah. To turn, you know, to make it, I don't know if it's making it less expensive so that people could get here, you know, and I don't know how you do that. I mean, economics are economics, you know, and Indeed. whatever, I know that whatever the ticket prices are here, I don't know exactly what they are. I don't think they're exorbitant, but they are certainly in general more than staying, they're more than staying home and watching television, mm-hmm. that's for sure. Yeah. Um but I know that ticket prices are an, a, a minuscule amount of what it takes to get a theater like this running and mount a show. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we mount shows here because of the tremendous support of, of a really incredibly active and vibrant board of directors and donors and um, people who I've over the past 10 years been able to get to know and like I can't believe what they give to this place Mm -hmm. Um, for places like this one thing I I think helps and I try to do what I can to educate uh, like you'll work some I'll work sometimes at a regional theater and I'll hear a fellow actors bitch Mm -hmm. you know 
yeah, I got to go do this Q and A with the board of directors, or I have to go to this, you know, meet and greet <laughs> cocktail party. And I'm like, who do you think pays? Yeah, your salary. <laughs> you know, go go talk. And these people give tens of thousands of dollars, right? And ask for nothing more than having their name on the program, on the show, as a producer or a supporter, and to get to meet us and peek behind the scenes. Yeah. And it's like any opportunity I have to go say thank you to them, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I don't have a job, and people like, you know, people like, uh, to Octavio Solis and and Richard Greenberg and Donald, they don't have a they don't have a voice without those mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. They certainly don't have a lab in which to right. you know. So, um, and the other biggest change I think would be for excuse my language the fucking government to recognize that arts make mm -hmm. the country, that arts and education make the country better and stronger. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the Washington Post has their motto, uh, democracy dies in darkness. Um, that's why this frickin' administration is doing everything it can to kill the arts, to kill mm -hmm. education, to kill the free dissemination of real information. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I just got so angry. <laughs> I just went to such a dark place. Well, let's not, let's not let it just sit there. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. Long before this particular administration, it seems as though government has a chip on its shoulder against the arts. They've been slowly peeling back whatever progress was made a couple of generations ago uh, for supporting the arts in our communities and in our schools. Uh, and but there's there's really strong stu you know studies and evidence that indicates that that kind of education goes far and above um, your basic reading, writing, and arithmetic to empower students to understand the world around them. Right. But when you understand the world around you, you work to make it better and uh -huh. make it change. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I was having a, a really interesting conversation with a, a woman the other day who's an economist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said something about markets and uh, the the economist Fisher Black who said you know in my in my models markets work um, <laughs> this idea that markets don't work yeah and sh and and uh, she said something about well markets don't work I said well you're an interesting economist then if you mm -hmm. think that markets don't work and we I said because it depends I, whether or not markets work depends on what your desired outcome uh -huh. is. Uh -huh. So if your desired outcome is pure profit, then maybe certain markets work. Mm -hmm. That's your, but if your desired outcome, let's say your desired outcome is a healthy population. Right. Markets don't work. Mm -hmm. Markets do not drive scientific innovation that is going to create the healthiest population. Right. Um, that's blasphemy in this country. Yeah, yeah. But uh, markets don't create roads. If, if markets created roads that were in good condition, we'd have, we'd have roads that are in good condition. Yeah, yeah. Um, the evidence is all around us, but we have these sort of platitudes mm -hmm. that we've decided are laws. Mm -hmm. so, some, I think Adam some... Smith and build a better mousetrap. And, uh -huh. 
makes sense in a small village yeah. that the guy who is the best cobbler uh-huh. in the small village is going to get the most work. Sure. We don't live in that world anymore. Right. The system's too many uh, layers deep now to think in that antiquated way. Yeah. I'm fascinated with this addiction of defending and being in love with and being addicted to free market capitalism. And then the moment it's costing you money, we need to, yeah. We need to like with these with these uh, these tariffs on that they're about to take effect. I think this Friday or next Friday. Right. And it's like, wait, wait! You you scream and shout about free market capitalism and the freedom to fail and the freedom to succeed. But the moment this industry is failing, you want to punish the world because they didn't because they were succeeding and they were right. Well, but they're succeeding because they're unfair. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a kind of madness there, a- and this adherence to platitudes that don't actually serve. Uh, let's call it. Let's dare use the term the common good. You know, uh. <laughs> <laughs> the common good. You mean the good good things for commoners? <laughs> it's a great cartoon I saw. Uh, I had to have been in high school. Uh-huh. It was a king sitting in his you know, tower by a window. And coming through the window is a speech bubble. It says, the peasants are revolting. And the king has got a wine glass in his hand. And he says, they certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I guess... And that's where we are right now, though, yeah. too. We've got this king who, even the even his own base, mm. he has disdain for and yeah. isn't helping. Yeah, and they eat it up. They love it. It's mind-blowing. They don't see that he is not really one of them. Right. I went up against, uh, I had a case against his father once when I was practicing law. Really? Um I've never used my father's name to try to get myself a job. Or first of all, I didn't think it would work. Uh-huh. If I thought it would work, I would have done it. No, <laughs> um, uh, but the, the business just doesn't work that way. You know, mm-hmm. who cares? But I'm in court in Queens, about to pick a jury, and I'd never picked a jury, so I'm all bluff. I'm terrified. Mm-hmm. And the lawyer was suing some corporation. I didn't know who the principals were, but the lawyer for the corporation, pulls me aside and says, you should really take our offer. And the offer was nothing. It was an insult. Right. You should really take our offer. Um, you know who my client is, don't you? And I said, no. I said, my client is Donald Trump's father. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, that's interesting. My father's Alan Arkin. Who gives a crap? Let's go pick a jury. <laughs> totally bluffing. I didn't know. It was, but it's like, it's like... He's Donald Trump's dad. My dad's famous. Let's go pick the jury. Screw you. Uh huh. We got a better settlement. Yeah. That was the only time I've used my father's name. That's a brilliant story. Yeah. Get yeah. me something in a in a Queens courthouse. <laughs> back, back in my previous life. That's epic. Thank now you. Now I only play lawyers on television. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You should put that story in a story. Somewhere. I should put it in a story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the era that we're living through, and if we do, if we do, presumably we probably will, despite all the scary saber rattling. Uh, and one of my earliest thoughts, I think, probably in the first weeks of his announcing, you know, he came down that golden escalator from his giant tower and he announced, "What a buffoon!" Right, and I thought this is going to be a circus. This is going to be a clusterfuck. And then the next thing that I know, I'm going to be living through the era of having to watch this on television again. And uh, I think that there's there's fertile ground there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, imagine the kinds of stories that if we don't attend to them as artists might be told about this period that we're living through. And what kinds of stories uh, artists um, may or may not be, you know, thinking about telling uh, as we live through it. Because it's it's crazy time yeah he's fun 
Mm -hmm. That's why I asked you uh, in our first conversation if, remember I asked you if you wanted to go into politics and you were like, no, too many skeletons in the closet. <laughs> Which, yeah. <laughs> but then I asked you, well, how do you feel about making art about politics? Because uh, someone with, your, your viewpoint on the era is one that I think is clear sided. Like you're not, you don't just arbitrarily hate him, which a lot of people do. You have really c clear reasons for what, like, this is a critique and here's why. And not many people, I... Th I arbitrarily hate him too, though. <laughs> I'll hate him in all different ways. <laughs> I think I have really good specific way reasons for hating him. Uh -huh. And I will add arbitrary on top of it, if that will help Absolutely. in any way. Fair enough. Well, uh, as... as <laughs> As the person sitting across from me, I say, I say, run with that and tell some stories because uh, you're a great storyteller. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to close on that as a compliment because I want to thank you for sharing stories. Unless you want to talk about more, we got time. No, I was just going to say that some of the stories that are coming out now, I don't want to tell because I never wanted a career in the porn industry. <laughs> and it seems to me like. That may be the direction we have to go uh, if we want to tell right. the true story of Donald Trump. Oh, God, yeah. That's the level of it. It, 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 it. There's something crazy. Harvey Weinstein, that whole thing breaks. And in the midst of it, Donald Trump seems to be... And we can't let that kind of behavior happen in show business. <laughs> Politics, okay. Yeah, let it. And I'm not saying it's okay in show business, but I'm saying it's interesting that mm -hmm. we draw the line at people misbehaving in show business. Yeah, yeah. But politics, do whatever you want. No, it's it's crazy. It's wild. Uh, well, I'm sure there's like hours more worth of theater stuff we can discuss. Sure. So uh, anytime you want to get together again to talk about them. But uh, for now, I want to thank you again for uh, some, some great stories and some insight into uh, your point of view on what this crazy industry is. I wanted to have the conversation with you because I suspected, based on previous discussions, that you'd have something above and beyond the mundane to share about theater and what it's capable of, of providing you know, the community that participate in it. And I think that's always a good thing to be reminded of. Because, uh, and I don't mean this as a negative statement, but it's too easy to get caught up in the oh, I've played this role, or I'm going to get cast in that role. Yeah. And there's a larger thing going on. Yeah. And I hope that uh, your I, I hope that your students see that in you too. I'm I'm, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that they do. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's, it's always fun. A pleasure, sir.